Conrad Steiner, Doctor of Medicine. Tonight's story has the title, And There Was Darkness, And There Was Light, Part Two. Guardian of birth, healer of the sick, comforter of the aged. And the qualities of the worthy physician are three. The eye of an eagle, the heart of a lion, the hand of a woman. Our actual case history tonight concerns the field of psychiatry, science of mental disorders. The object in point, a crucifix. The case in point, Frances Annette Dunbar. She's 30 years old, married, and she's given birth to four children. For about 30 years, she had tried to repress the vague, indefinite fears which, despite her efforts, kept growing in her mind. Finally, the breaking point was reached. With the birth of her fourth child, the pent-up fears exploded. For no explainable reason, Frances Dunbar tried to murder her newborn baby. This is not her face or her voice, but these are her actual words. The first evening in the receiving room of the hospital, I kept trying to remember what had brought me there. I was being signed into a hospital. My husband George and Dr. Steiner were there, and Sister Benedict and Sister Mary Frances, who had nursed me through my last childbirth. But why were they there? We'll be up to see you, Mom. Often. Look, don't worry about the kids and me. Your job is to get well again. Bye, honey. What had I done? Make yourself comfortable, Mrs. Dunbar. I'll only be a moment longer. Cindy's up to her room. I was alone. Alone with my question. Why was I there? And as I stayed at the crucifix, the answer came back to me. I saw again what I tried to do. I saw myself in my own home, sitting there, all alone, with my new baby nearby. I saw myself rise from my seat, move about the room, trying to deny what could no longer be denied. Somehow, my mind had hardened into a frightening determination. I had to kill my new baby. I saw myself move to the baby, pick it up, and I saw myself moving to the stove. Once again, closer and closer. I was reaching out to put the baby into the stove. And then the merciful blackness came that saved my baby's life. I don't want to hurt my baby. I don't. I don't. Of course not, Mrs. Dunbar. Of course not. This way, Mrs. Dunbar. I 
I tried to sleep that night, but although I, I shut my eyes, sleep would not come. The frightening sounds from the corridor and the, the twisting shadows in my room seemed to me like voices and shapes from the dead. And all about me, strange, frightening things seemed to move, move and beckon. And, and even when I closed my eyes, the, the images would not leave me. I, I knew that they were there in the room, not in my mind. And I knew that there was something in the closet, some wild animal. An animal that was going to tear me with its fangs. I wanted to run, but I couldn't. My entire body had turned to ice, and nothing would move. And the animal kept coming closer and closer, and I could feel it by my bedside. I knew it was there looking down at me, and then... <laughs> Dunbar, it's just old Mrs. Trenton. You shouldn't have left your room, Mrs. Trenton. She thought it was her own bed. She gets lost sometimes. Mrs. Trenton is a very sweet old lady. Everybody here likes her. You will, too. You'll be good friends. I'm sorry if I frightened you. There. You try to go to sleep. There's nothing to be afraid of here. We're all your friends. Come along, Mrs. Trenton. I'll take you back to your room. I thought I was in my own room, Marge. Really? Yes, yes, I know. I understand. The next day, I was told some of the hospital rules. I could have the freedom of the corridors, and at the end of the corridor was a reception room. But I stayed in my own room all day long. I was too afraid of the patients to go out. During the second night, other thoughts started crowding into my mind. Thoughts about sharp objects, hammers, scissors, pieces of sharp metal. For many years, I'd been afraid of weapons and anything that might be used as a weapon. And now my mind was crowded with them. I, I don't know why. I never know why. realize at the time that there was really nothing to fear. I don't know about other state mental hospitals, but at this one, the doctors and nurses treated me with patience and kindness and understanding. But of course, I was in no condition to see that during those first days. After some time, I was moved to a new room in a different ward. It was quieter, and I was not so afraid of the patients there. I was given some shots, a brain wave, my fingerprints were taken, and my case thoroughly evaluated. Also, I began to attend classes in psychology. And it was then I started to suffer worse physical pains than I had ever suffered before. I had heart attacks. It was real pain, not imaginary except there was never anything organically wrong with my heart to account for it. <laughs> Some of the sisters came up on sick calls. I thought you'd like to see a familiar face. So I came along with them for a little visit. Oh, sister. I wish I could die. Please tell them let me die. Did I tell you, Francis? This used to belong to my older sister. She suffered from trouble like yours for half her life. 
In those days, there was no one who could help her. This was her only help. Oh, Sister Benedict. I only want to die. God forgive me, but that's all I ask for. You're going to get well, Francis. We'll pray for you. And you pray for yourself. You're going to get well. But for the next two days, I kept praying only for death. I begged Almighty God to free me. Do you recognize it? It's your suitcase. Pretty? You're wondering why I brought your clothes to you? Because you're going to wear them when you see Dr. Clifford. Personal appearance is very important here. Dr. Clifford? He's one of our psychotherapists. He's going to help you get well again. He's going to help you to get well again. I kept saying it over and over. It gave me strength to see him. Dr. Clifford was a pleasant man, although I didn't like him at first. He gave me two tests, the intelligence test and an inkblot test. I was to tell what pictures I saw in the inkblots, much as one sees the shape of things in cloud formations. It all seemed pointless to me. I, I wanted sympathy, pity. I didn't know it at the time, but I was getting something better, understanding. In the first month, he made me understand how my job was to bring the fears that were hidden deep in my subconscious out into the light of the conscious mind. Facing reality, I would learn to change things that could be changed and understand and accept the things that were impossible to change. But why do you think yours was such an unhappy childhood? Because it was. My father drank an awful lot. He was an alcoholic and... I was afraid of him. He used to spank me a lot, so I guess I lied to avoid a beating. Uh, they sent me up here to my aunt and uncle's. They needed help around the house. Is that when you met your husband? Yes. After a few dates, he wanted to get married. Well, I... I thought my aunt and uncle expected me to marry him because they liked him so much. So I promised. I kept my promise. On the way to my own wedding, I hoped I would be killed so I wouldn't have to go through with it. And on my wedding night, well, we, when we finally got to our room, I, I wouldn't even go near my husband. I, I wouldn't even change my clothes. I just sat there in a chair all night long and cried from shame. As the weeks went by, Dr. Clifford made me see how all my life I had done things I didn't want to do. I was afraid I would be punished somehow if I didn't. We were poor and I blamed it on my husband. I feared pregnancy. I told Dr. Clifford that my husband had none of the qualities that I admired. And little by little, I began to realize that my own husband through no fault of his own, stood between me and the world of sanity. When was the first time you experienced this fear of children? Oh, it started a long time ago. About how old were you? Can you remember? Oh, I must have been five or six. 
I, I had these friends, uh, neighborhood kids. And, well, we played doctor. You know how kids are. My father found us, and both he and my mother yelled about how bad and sinful it was. And, well, I, I... I guess every time I look at little children, I expect to hear my parents yelling like they did then. There was never any explanation about sex at home. And there was no affection. In fact, I can, can't remember my father ever kissing my mother. And when I asked questions, I was spanked. More weeks passed. I tried to remember all incidents like that. I wrote them down so I could talk about them with Dr. Clifford. I began to understand one thing clearly. I had gone into marriage not as a mature woman, but as a frightened child full of ignorant prejudices. My fears about the baby stemmed from the fact that I married a man that I was childishly rejecting. So that while I loved the baby consciously, I rejected her subconsciously because I did not want a baby fathered by a man I didn't love. And yet, in my state of emotional immaturity, I could not have known what love was. I could not have been happy with any man. When my husband and the older children began to visit me, I would look at George in silence, asking myself question after question about our life together. I didn't hate George, and I didn't love him. I felt nothing. It was June. My feelings toward my husband did not change. He was a stranger. A stranger I would have to learn to know. I became more and more dependent on Dr. Clifford. He was a father to whom I could say anything and everything without shame and without fear of punishment. Look who showed up. Big surprise. Hello, Francis. Sister. Uh, <laughs> I brought you out some pictures of the babies. From George, he's getting very good with that camera of his. Stephen. Oh, Helen, look at them. They must take after their mother. <laughs> this one's the image of his father. Oh, he's a nice-looking boy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, Dr. Clifford asked me to bring you out some things to make something for the baby. Oh, oh I don't know. What could I make? Well, the little one needs a sweater. I think I have everything here. Good, you didn't forget the knitting needles. I thought I had a little pair of scissors, but I... The life of me, I don't know what became of them. I must have dropped them. Oh, that's all right, sister. I can get one from Supply. Oh. I... What is it? I had forgotten all about it. At some time during my visits with Dr. Clifford, the scissors that I had hidden under the cushion had slipped completely out of my mind. It had become unimportant enough to forget. What I used to think of as a deadly weapon was only an ordinary pair of scissors I had misplaced. My second summer at the hospital was coming to an end. And one day, toward the middle of September, Dr. Clifford began to push me away, gently, tapering off my dependence on him. My visits to his office were made shorter, and he saw me only twice a week after that. I was beginning to stand on my own two feet, thinking for myself. George and the children began to come more often, bringing pictures of the baby, of the house, of my mother. I do bingo. And look. Oh, they're nice pictures, George. <laughs> I just push the button, the camera does the rest. I got some good news. I got a raise. That's wonderful, George. Oh, uh, it's not much. It's just a little raise, but... Well, your mother and I, we figured we could start saving up now for when you come home. For what when I come home? Well, you always wanted a nice room of your own. And, well, we figured that we could start saving now. In a few months, we'd have enough to fix up that old side room for you. You know, your mother's got some really great ideas about color and, and drapes and stuff like that. Well, that's nice, George, but what about my ideas? Well, we only wanted to do something nice for you. Did I do something wrong again? Of course not. You haven't been wrong, George. I've been wrong. You see, I've been taught something here. Well, it's simply this. 
from here on in, you know, even in little things like fixing up a room, well, there's only one person alive that can make decisions and make up my mind. And, well, that's me. Grant, I'm not a very bright guy. But I, I know I, I must have done something wrong. Whatever, whatever it was, I won't ever do it again. Fran, I, I maybe don't know how to show it very much, but you mean an awful lot to me. Be just a little bit patient, please. say that now. I love you. Summer passed into autumn, and autumn into winter. And then one day in early December, Dr. Clifford explained to me about the family care job. It was a step toward rehabilitating me back to my own responsibilities as a wife, a mother, and a homemaker. I was allowed to leave the hospital every day to take care of an old couple in the next town. By caring for them properly, I gained proof that I could care for my own loved ones. It was the last test, and the month of December was a happy one for me. It was the day before Christmas. The joy of simply being alive filled every moment. I'd be going home soon, someday in the coming new year, home to my children, my husband, and to my baby. Hello, Fran. I hope I'm not disturbing you. No, no. I was just finishing up my crash here. I told Jessie so much about it, she wanted to come over and see it. Jessie, this is Mrs. Dunbar. Hello, Jessie. Your little girl? Mm-hmm. I thought maybe you could show her your crash while I was in C3, helping them get ready for the Christmas Eve party tonight. Oh, I'd love to show Jessie. Are you having guests for the party? Oh, yes, yes. My husband is bringing over the older children, and Dr. Steiner said he'd stop in for a little while. That's wonderful. Don't let Jesse bother you too much. I'll be only 10 or 15 minutes. Oh, you take as long as you like. Thanks. Would you like to put the baby Jesus in for me? You two'd better get dressed for the party. <laughs> I can finish up. There's only the tinsel left. Look who I found. Merry Christmas. Dr. Steiner, how nice of you to take the time to drive out. Dr. Clifford was good enough to pick me up. Mrs. Steiner had some late shopping to do, last minute things. We always plan to avoid it, and every year it happens. <laughs> no. <laughs> Merry Christmas, Bingo. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Merry Christmas, honey. I think this is the happiest Christmas of my whole life. <laughs> we brought you another present. Considering the funds available to them and the shortage of staff personnel, state mental hospitals are doing a remarkable job. But their task is made needlessly more difficult by public prejudice. There is nothing about mental illness to be ashamed of, and it cannot be cured except by the skill of specially trained doctors. And thanks to those doctors whose lives are devoted to healing the mentally ill, thousands of men and women have been able to return to their rightful places in society happy, well-adjusted, and unafraid. <laughs>